Hello, hello. This is episode six of the Tuesday Night Fiction Podcast. I'm Nicholas Austin, and tonight we're going to be talking about chapter three, The Enemy of My Enemy. Cannot believe we're already on episode six. To the bold alone, welcome. It's been a fun ride already. It's been going very fast. Um, and podcasting is definitely a really interesting thing. Especially with the music and the book together. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. We're also going to talk about a recap of chapters 1 to 3 in just a second. First, just wanted to say, if you like what you're hearing so far on this channel, as always, um, I am an author. So these are This podcast is based on books. So if you would like to support the series, you can always go on to Amazon, buy the books, paperback or ebook there. It would be greatly appreciated if you have already read the books and you're enjoying the ride, um, please subscri- please, uh, per- please go on Amazon and review or any other website that they're sold on and review. Um, you can find all the information on where they're available at nbaustinbooks.com. Um, and if you're listening on the podcast, you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to, to do that. Like, share, subscribe to the podcast as much as possible, especially because um, as I mentioned in previous episodes, we have a giveaway still going on. It's going to go on through the next two episodes. And uh, for episode eight, I'm going to be announcing a winner. And the winner will get um, three copy, the first cop, three copies of the first three books of the Civil Land series signed by me, as well as a copy of Ready Player One, all paperback books. Um, so all you have to do to win is like, or is to share um, on your social media. Share the podcast, share the books, share whatever you'd like. Um, if you're enjoying it, let it, let the world know. And if you could, if you could tag me, or you could just take a screenshot and send it to my contact form on uh, on my website, that would be fantastic. That's my dog in the background, by the way. She's she's shaking it out and going to her room to lay down. Um, this video is also available on YouTube. If you want to see my pretty face while I talk, um, you could go there and check it out there. The discussion episodes will all be available in video and audio. The regular chapter episodes, while they are also on YouTube, um, will only be audio. So let's get let's get into chapters one to three. Um, I didn't really. It was tough. It was tough for weeks one and two going too much into content because um, it's really hard to not give spoilers while you're talking about only the first two chapters and you're already I guess four books in but today I want to just do a recap and talk a little bit more about certain things like characters and and ideas. So for chapter one, as you remember, um, we started out with Jeannie Morrell. She's running through the woods. She's getting chased down by the Keegan gang, Walter Keegan and a group of his men have run her down from her house, which they lit on fire, as we found out. And Jeannie had to cross the river. In the end, Jeannie is saved by the Vahani, a clan in the Riverland, a native clan in the Riverlands. All this taking place in a place called the Murrieta Territory. The Vahani are going through an interesting time themselves because for them... They have recently discovered a Tokali in the Marietta Territory. And a clan that's been their rivals for for years and years. A member who is named Elon has come to the Riverlands and confessed that that the Tokali are having troubles with Easterners who are coming into the territory threatening them at their various lo- at their various camps and they would like to unite with the Vahani. Um, this is told directly to Latera first, who is the brother of Hansa or sorry, sister of Hansa. Um, both both children of the chieftain in the Riverlands, Arcuda. As we found out at the end, Arcuda is unfortunately shot down by his own his own councilmen, who the councilmen are 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 basically the voices in the in the in the chieftain's ear. And Hansa is forced to escape the scene. Genie is a Keegan. 
And that's where we kind of leave off on chapter one. So chapter two, we find out a little bit more about the Keegan gang, particularly William Keegan. So William Keegan is the leader of the Keegan gang, Walter Keegan being his cousin. And William is also the brother of Daniel Keegan, who at that time is in, Fi is in their mansion in the town of Fayette, which is in central Marietta, as well as Clovis Keegan, who was part of the attack on the Morrell home and ultimately led the attack on the Morrell home. The mansion is a little bit of an interesting place, along with Daniel and William's closest partner, Gregory Calloway. We also have Donna and Blanton Keegan, who are an interesting pair. Um, and as well, there is a wedding to be had between William and Judith Abigail. So Judith is the daughter of Henry Abigail, who came from the east, from William's hometown, where his father is also located. His father is a bit of a kingpin there, so William wanted to prove to his father that he could make something of himself in the Marietta Territory, and by having Henry Abigail, who was a close associate of his father, come... His goal, as he tells Judith in chapter 2, is to prove, is to have kind of a voice in his father's ear once he's kind of gotten more control and ultimately wants to form a, a bit of a unity between the East and West, um, a, a, a partnership of trade and ultimately a very lucrative opportunity for him and his father. Finally, like I said, proving to his father that he is capable of all the things his father did not think he was growing up. Obviously, William, well, we learn more as the chapters, as the first couple chapters go on, had a tough, tough, had a tough childhood. Um, he talks with Daniel in chapter three about this. Um, Daniel tries to tell him not to worry um, about just his father's approval, as he said, as it says, as we find out he has in the past. But William has a really hard time with that. William is, is a sensitive, sensitive character, um, strong willed and very determined. Um, and he's set, very set in his ways. So they have the wedding in Fayette in chapter three. Um, some interesting things go down at the wedding. Um, all, all seems to go mostly well up until the point at the end where a massive flock of crows come along. Um, William is drunk at this time, so that makes for a bit of a chaotic scene. And Daniel ultimately has to usher William inside and make sure that the rest of the wedding goes well. So that's the story in Fayette up till this point. As for back in the Riverlands, we find more out about the fate of Hansa and Jeannie. So Jeannie gets taken to the Vahani camp um, by the councilman who betrayed Chieftain Arcuda. Ultimately, there, she she is obviously very shattered and upset about what happened, um, dealing with a memory that she had in the past met a Keegan and didn't recognize the threat that he posed while on a while on a uh, a bit of a like a helping her brother in town with some of their trade routes. Her father. Um, was very prominent in the Riverlands, an ally of Arcuda, and kind of helped to connect the natives and the Easterners in the Riverlands. So her oldest brother Harrison would would help with some of their trade routes through the town of Haran, and Jeannie one day went along with him and their other brother Donovan into town, um, met a couple of the people from town, one being Dominic Turner, who we later find a little bit out a little bit more about. And on on, on that journey, um, on that little day's trip, she they as a, as the three of them ran into Daniel Keegan. So Daniel didn't seem to didn't seem a threat at first. Obviously, he seemed a little bit different, but he expressed his intent to meet with their father. 
So Jeannie feeling a little bit guilty now is stuck in a cell um, in the Riverlands. It is also hard on Laterra, who the councilmen tell Laterra that that Arcuda and Hansa were killed. They, she is obviously broken. Um, Laterra has no mother. Her mother died years ago. Hansa and Arcuda are the only ones left in the picture, and she's just very broken. Laterra, um, as we talked a little bit about last week, because chapter two kind of was her breaking point. And in chapter two is when there is an attack on the Riverlands camp, or so it seemed. It was a divert, a divert, a divertive attack, um, in which a bunch of fireworks were launched. The natives didn't really know what fireworks were, so they were kind of dealing with this horror um, of these li the lions popping in the air. They obviously thought it was the Keegans coming for Walter. Um, turned out it wasn't, but Laterra in that moment is pretty broken. So Laterra is a a quieter, less out out in the world type in the beginning of the series. She was just is a nurse. She's a Vahani, and her little world is her little world. She's okay with not being part of the politics. She's okay with not being um not being the leader and that is kind of when her father dies when her brother dies when uh, when the when the boy who who comes from the tokali is 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 put in her responsibility to be treated it's not easy and she is kind of thrust into this greater world all at once it's not an easy thing to deal with and the pressure collectively breaks her in chap in in chapter two she, when this attack takes place she is distraught she is just freaking out and does not know how to handle it she has to be calmed and ultimately the the councilmen rush to her to make sure that all is well because obviously they know that they know something that she doesn't they need to make sure that she doesn't figure anything out but she's breaking, and fortunately for her, um, Elon comes to her side. And they, after bonding in chapter one, um, he somewhat helps her through this attack. So once the attack finishes, we find out um, in chapter three that it was actually Dominic and Hansa who are able to rescue Jeannie Morell. Um, Dominic was an old acquaintance. We found, I think, I think that was chapter two where we, where, um, Hansa and Dominic were able to talk through. He was, Dominic's life was saved at one point in the, in the past by Jeannie's father. And he was forever grateful. And he's, feels, he has always felt a debt owed to the Morel family for that, for what they've been able to do in Haran. Dominic used to be part of a gang and, that experience scarred him, but having a community in Haran was kind of what he came to the Marietta hopeful to find, and that was, again, provided by the Morels. So his ability to save Jeannie was, meant a lot to him. And in, pro, in, their, in their scheme to attack the Riverlands, or, or at least to set off a divert, divertive attack on the Vahani of the Riverlands, um... Their goal was to save Laterra as well, but obviously that didn't work out due to the increased security that the councilman had on her. Um, there really was no opportunity for for Jeannie and Dominic to successfully save Laterra without um, without tripping off the the eye of the councilman or the the various guards that were around Laterra. And ultimately, if they would have went after her, just would have would have ruined their plan altogether. So Latera's stuck. Jeannie, um, Jeannie Harrison, I mean, sorry, Jeannie Hanza and Dominic uh, have run off successfully. 
and they're work they're now walking their way up the river the opposite direction that they're hoping the Vahani will go now that they know that the Vahani will most likely go south with Elon on their way up they notice or they come across the place of the um, attack on Walter Keegan's men that the Vahani um, carried out when Jeannie first ran away there they spot Clovis Keegan with his men observing observing the scene Clovis is obviously, uh, we find out a bit of a Cretan. He's there with one of his closest men, Devin Turpin. And they're just horrible. I mean, they're they're dark um, thrill seekers, as we, as we hear a little bit in the Keegan Mansion. Um, and they're now after Walter, who's obviously very important as their cousin. So, on the walk back, Jeannie... Um, after after experiencing that a little bit, we we see Dominic do a little bit of magic. Um, Jeannie it, um, is obviously very distraught, and in chapter three, she sings a song that her mother sang, and that song actually happens to be the lead-in to all of our chapter episodes um, called "When the Shadows Run." I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, but. For now, I think I think pretty sure that's where that's where we're at all together. So, just a lot of uh, a lot of mayhem in the first three chapters. Um, an interesting an interesting dynamic starting to be developed, and we're gonna find out a little bit more, obviously, about where these journeys are headed. But for now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the song. So this chapter carries great importance to me because it was the first time that I realized the possibility of mixing kind of creative pursuits. So back in high school, um, and I I mean still now, I've played music my entire life. I played music way before I started writing, writing book, writing stories, I mean. And I wrote music, writing music was one of my favorite things to do. I didn't really enjoy the cover scene quite as much. I mean, playing music covers is is a part of learning, but um, expressing myself through writing music was always, um, became one of my, one of my life, like purposes pretty much. And, And especially in high school. Going through hard times like we talked about last week. I think that's one of the things that most got me through. And I played in bands. I played a lot. And I played on my own time. Wherever I could. As much as I could. um, I wrapped myself up in that. But over time. It became harder and harder to. Kind of feel like I was pursuing it. And to me. I like to pursue. I like Whatever I'm working on. I feel like I need. I want to I want to pursue it. I mean, I like to do things in my downtime, but if there's something that I'm that passionate about, I just feel like like it gets it gets to be kind of like a a, a guilt factor. Um I mentioned I think I mentioned that when with writing um where I would critique t- the TV shows I was watching quite a bit, and the more I critiqued, the more I was like, well, if I'm going to be this critic, then I I mean, I don't want to be a critic, right? I just I want to I want to do, I want to create. So I kind of lost that with the music a little bit as I, as I moved on, I kind of realized that I wasn't giving it what I, what I would have wanted to give it. And that became pretty hard. I mean, that became pretty hard to accept. Um, so I kind of just put it off and I just did it more in my downtime. But with this chapter, and I don't know if I planned it immediately when I wrote, when I decided to have her sing the song, but if not, it was very quick. Um, I had, re- I think I'd been inspired by the Lord of the Rings, actually, where I think it's Pippin when he sings the song, um, and I th- and I think Gondor for I think it's Faramir's father the guy who like i mean he eventually gets lit on fire and jumps off a 
jumps off a cl- like a large building or something. But he sings the song for the father, and they kind of like they have the music in the background while he's singing it in the scene. And I thought that that was really cool. Um, so I kind of wanted that. And from once the chapter was written, I actually decided to make it into a full song, which is now actually on YouTube. And like I only I obviously only had her sing like a like a verse or two, I think, in the in the chapter, but I extended it out into like a full five minute song. And that honestly was one of the most exciting experiences possible. I mean, this was way before I decided that I had even thought about podcasting as an option. I wasn't even listening to podcasts at the time. I didn't know anything about them. So I kind of, the idea that you could mix the two, like your creative passions into, into one, like you could bring music and, and story together like that was so exciting. I mean, I, I think I would have kept writing no matter what. I think writing has been, and equal like something that I'm equally passionate about is music, but having the two come together like just amplified it. I mean, I, it made the writing more enjoyable because I was thinking story in in terms of music. I was thinking about how the music influences the story, and I wrote the song in a lot of ways based on the mood. And I didn't really think about mood as much when I wrote, um when I wrote music by itself. I mean, obviously, like, I would write based on the mood I was in, but it wasn't as much of, like, a, like, how does this song define, like, tonally and lyrically and just all together exactly, like, how does it tell a story, pretty much? And that was something that made the writing, the music writing process a lot more enjoyable was... When I'm writing a when I'm writing a a musical riff or like a or like a verse or or whatever, how how does that how can I picture in my head how am I picturing in my head what is taking place in the story that this song was built from? And it, it's really um, I, I we could I've been traveling for the past two weeks. Uh, I went to New York actually to play more music with. Um, the band that I always used to play with in high school, and and then uh, I took a, had a trip to Denver last week. That's why I missed last week's episode. Very sorry about that. Going to try to never let that happen again. But you know, like I said, podcast podcasting is still new. I actually sat down and and tried to do this. Like I mean, I had the I think I had the time, but I just it, this was between the New York and the Denver trip. Like I was traveling last Tuesday I was traveling to Denver like the next day and I just could not I just couldn't get the words out I mean every, this is my first take right now I was on like take 10 and usually I don't have any takes with these discussions I usually just kind of go through it but I just hated the way I sounded I mean I was just mentally exhausted from a week of traveling and then another week to come so again apologies but we're back you know, we're back. The gang is back. The leader is back. But anyway, um, so we, back when I was in New York, um, obviously thinking a lot about music because I was playing music for, for like the first time live in a while, a lot of fun. But also my my brother recently got into, got is getting more into music and he kind of had a question about not only like what sounds good, like like how to know whether you're you're sounding good, but also about how to make it interesting, how to release it, how to how to how to put it out into the world in a way that people will pay attention to. And this is exactly the example I thought of. I mean, because you don't differentiate by not differentiating i don't know if that makes any sense at all it probably doesn't but it if you like two different things i mean if you if you can mix two different abilities or you can think about how to be different like what are what makes you different what do you love what do you hate what 
what what are other people doing that you think that you've thought could be better like how could they have released something better how could they have put a spin on something was it too similar to something else was it was there something that you're thinking of that was incredibly different how was it different and you ha- i mean those thoughts come into your head all the time they might be subconscious they're usually subconscious but exploring that as much as possible has been something that has made I think this process a lot more interesting for me. So like, again, I wasn't podcasting at that time. I, I mean, I literally, I think the idea to podcast started maybe last December. It, it was pretty late in the, in the series writing process, but as many, as many ideas that you think you can do effectively and you would enjoy doing, if it's as, if it's cooler than you think possible, just do it. I mean, like, there, if you would have first, when I first thought maybe I'll do a, a podcast alongside the series, I probably initially thought that's impossible. I mean, there's like too much that goes into that, that I wouldn't know how to do. That would take a long time to set up that I would, that I wouldn't understand. I don't, I didn't think I had, I mean, two things in particular, one, the voice acting, which is like. I'm probably bad at, I mean, I, I honestly, have, I, I, I don't, I try not to get too into it, but also try to be, I mean, obviously I'm into it. I love doing it, but it's, it's something where you have to acknowledge kind of your limitations so that you don't overdo it. And then, so the voice acting and then also like the production, because while I always liked making music, I was never great at, at producing like the right quality music. Um, so those two things, and then being able to produce at a, at a clip, um, that I thought reasonable. So like coming up with new, a new episode once a week, if possible. Um, I know I haven't always lived up to that so far, but I'm trying. And so, so yeah, so, I mean, there's obviously all these, all these limitations you have in your mind when you, when you first kind of think of, of this, of these kind of ideas, but you overcome them. I mean, and you have to because this, like, these are the kind of things that make you you and make you interesting, and that you know are interesting. So again, I, I mean, I think I talked about this before, but again, these are rants. So if I repeat myself ever, it's because the point matters, right? Like, I, I've, if I'm repeating myself, which I will, and I almost will do it intentionally, but sometimes not, but. If you know what's interesting to you, you know what's interesting to someone else. You know what's interesting, period. There's truth in your interest and there is an audience for your interest. So the more you can think of these ideas or the more these ideas, not even just think about it, but the more these ideas that are interesting come to you, the more you should be just immediately doing them. I mean, like, write it down, start doing it, go buy the equipment, go buy the microphone, (laughs) go buy the headset. Um, the video game headset that you're using for, for your podcast. I want to be PewDiePie, okay? What can I say? Subscribe to PewDiePie. But anyway, so so yeah, so mix the mix ideas as much as possible. I mean, it, it is creatively one of the best parts of this process. It, it has been, especially as someone who doesn't read a ton. Um, I, like, I said, I've, like I've said before, I love stories, but I don't read a ton. So being able to mix the different mediums together that I do love has been fantastic. I mean, it's been the most fulfilling thing I've done in my whole life. And I very much encourage you to do the same. So now that we've talked a little bit about inspirations and the song, I want to keep talking about inspirations. So while traveling on one of my better flights, which was Delta, Fly Delta, very good airline, a lot of the other ones suck, I got to re-watch a movie called The Prestige, and it, The Prestige is one of my favorite movies of all time, honestly, it's, it's about two rival illusionists who just obsess over bettering one another, and from beginning to end, 
you don't really know what to see, how to see what's coming, coming. I think that's kind of the point of the movie. But that book definitely, or that movie definitely was a big inspiration for the series, especially now as I'm further along in it. Looking back on these couple chapters, so Dominic Turner was a big inspiration from for from the movie The Prestige. Um, his character, as as I've said in previous episodes, kind of a like a jack of all trades, um, like a Swiss Army knife, actually. Um, definitely came in a big way from that movie, and. It's really interesting again to mix kind of those those mediums together, like to mix different ideas together. Um, so he ends up actually being the theme of this chapter as well, or, or at least what the title was based off of, "The Enemy of My Enemy." Like he starts out as a as a character in the first couple chapters, who the, who Hansa and, and who Hansa first, and then obviously Genie don't know a ton about. So. But he's helping them, right? He's the only person that's helping them. Both characters, both characters are pretty are are pretty young, as we found out. Um, I believe like thirteen and fourteen, respectively, and are alone in the world. They're the enemy of their he he is the enemy of their enemy. So he they have to trust him, and it's really interesting. Like his ability to be kind of all things and and a bunch of different things at the same time. Um, has made him a pleasure to write. And he definitely is one of the characters that I relate with the most. As I said last week, he was, he was definitely one of the most fun to write um, at first. Uh, I, I had a lot of ideas about the things he struggles with. We're going to find out a little bit more about that um, as we go. Um, we, saw, we saw actually in his conversation with Hansa that went about that the gang was a big a big past memory for him so he was part of a gang um, himself and he went through the experience of being asked to kill for the gang and we find out that he did it and it was too much it was a lot for him it weighs on him very heavily and again that was the kind of backstory that is cool because you're not immediately you're not writing about the experience right like you're not that that story is a separate one <coughs> excuse me that story is not part of this story but it is at the same time and those kind of storylines are the ones that are actually like they take a they take a little bit more to think about they're really um you don't kind of immediately start with them usually but when they hit you it's it's one of the best feelings cuz it's kind of the kind of the thing that builds over time and it's funny how they end up mattering a lot um, almost almost unintentionally um, it, it's almost unintentional the way that you kind of build backstory backstory ends up leading to characters that are almost real right or at least to you to you they're real as a writer um, but yeah, so like our backstories kind of define what happens to us in the future and how we react to things in the future. So um, that was definitely a very fun part about starting out. Anyway, so that's my a little bit about my one of the inspirations behind where we're at right now. One of my that was one of my again my one of my really early inspirations for this book. And now I want to talk about. We're going to finish off um, here. It's going to be a little bit shorter this week. Probably like, I think I think all the episodes probably will end up being between like 40 and 60 minutes. Some of the chapters will definitely be much shorter. I think this one was a little bit shorter. It was like 30 to 40 minutes or something like that. But a lot will always be packed into it. So don't you worry. It's going to be fun. As for the next thing, the final thing I would like to discuss. So two fears. I want to talk about fear, right? And this is kind of also related to, like I said, one of the things I was talking to my brother about. The first fear is early cringe. 
So Crimson River is the first book I wrote. Crimson River, when I wrote it, I was still a time where I was basically putting a fire hose in my mouth and drinking as fast as I could in terms of learning about writing. However, even though, I would say that even though you need to, you need to produce the greatest content you could possibly produce, you need to produce something that you are proud to have out in the world that you think that you would enjoy that is worth someone's time. I think looking back that I feel that way. I definitely feel that way. I mean, this story means the world to me. And at the time, I did the best I possibly could on it. However, second time, however, two howevers, it is an early work. It's definitely the kind of thing where you look back on your... I mean, no matter what you're doing, you're always going to look back on your early work and cringe at certain things. For me, in, all, in full disclosure, some of that was the, the dialogue, I think, between the characters. Um, it was something that I was still learning how to do. It's something that I've, I know for a fact I've improved on immensely, even from book one to two. But there is that feeling of when you look back at the first one and you're, and you're like, man, like if I only knew then what I knew now. But you can't think that way. And here's why. So, again, if it's not good enough, if you read it and you're like, why would I make people read this? Why would I? This is a waste of people's time. You need to be honest with yourself about it. But if you do... You also have to be honest with yourself about going forward. When is it worth it to go forward and when is it worth it to go back? And for me, there, despite that initial thought of, man, could I, like, I wish, like, like I said, I wish I knew then what I do now. The, the point is, is you can't. You can't know then what you know now. So when you're going forward, go forward, right? Like if you're if you were if your work is the best it could have possibly been at a time when it was made, then you keep advancing. You keep making the next thing better. And again, if if it was if it was unreadable if it was the kind of thing where it, what, it wasn't conveying the message that I wanted it to convey, then I would take it back. I would redo it. I would change a lot about it. Um, but it's not that. And it's a waste of time for me to do that. I know that. So, again, there is that. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to acknowledge what needs to be acknowledged. But you also should not be discouraged, especially early in the journey. Like now I'm two years in and I'm so happy with, with where this book took me. And I felt the same thing actually with the first episode of the podcast. I mean, it came out beyond my expectations, but this leads to the second the second fear. With the first episode, and, I, and the only reason why I talk about this now, I, I, I thought originally about saving this for when we get into the chapters closer to book two, but I'm feeling it right now and I want to talk about it right now. With the podcast episodes, I felt less like, chap, like I did chapter one Poorly. I actually think the first one came out really like I was blown away by how well it came out, to be honest. I am so good at what I do. And you're just go on and rate me five stars already if you haven't. Go ahead and go to Amazon or go to your podcatcher and just just smash that five star button. 
smash the share button. Do everything you can to support me, because I'm fantastic at what I do. But following up, that's the second fear. So like I said, sometimes you're going to do something and you're going to start out early. For some people, that's making music. And you make music and you're making a song and you're initially like, well, I'm still learning. I'm still getting better. But I want to release this because I think it's, I think it conveys what I want it to convey. I think the song conveys the message and I think that it will find people's ears and they will be pleased with it. Could it be better in the future? Sure. But this isn't the future. This is now. So I'm going to release it. That's the early fear. The next fear is getting it out there. And then having to follow it up. So, with, like I said, with chapter one, I was really pleased with it. Um, but after finishing it, I was like, holy shit, what if I can't do that again? What if, what if that was a one-time effort and now that it's out there, what if people listen and they like it and then I have to actually follow it up with something that's also good or and how do I deal with that pressure right I mean how do I how do I live up with each coming episode and with each coming book and I felt that definitely with book one to two and even, like I said even though you have that early cringe and you're still learning um, when you're going through a massive undertaking it's kind of it's scary I mean it's a scary thing to have to go into the second one. What if the ideas don't come back? What if the ideas aren't as exciting? What if they don't lead anywhere? What if this just fizzles, right? And that was something that I great, I mean, book two was a scary one to write. But I think that Overall, the mission stays the same. Overall, you know... Like, if you're planning to write a series in particular, like you, you're not writing the series for book one. If you're writing a standalone book, you're not writing that book for just chapter one. Like, if you write a great first chapter in a standalone book and you, you're afraid to do chapter two because you're like, what if it's not as good? I mean, I guess that's the point of what I'm saying is you could break it down so many ways, right? Like when you finish, when you finish book, when I finished book one, I guess the way I could have thought about it then, if I were to talk to myself then, was, was to, would be to be like there, you made it from chapter one to chapter two, right? You made it from section one to section two, because section one in book, in, in the first chapter is a crazy one, right? It's like one where a girl is running through the woods and that was the only idea that I had. It's just started out with something very small, something not focused, something not defined. And it was continued through 10 chapters. So basically I think, yeah, the point of what I'm trying to say again is that you could break what you're doing down so small. If you write an, a music album, you could break it down into... Well, you wrote 10 songs. You didn't write one. You wrote 10. And even in that one song, in, in the first song you wrote, you didn't write just one part. You wrote a verse and a chorus. You followed up the verse with a good chorus. And it becomes a lot less scary, I think, when you think about it that way. And I honestly didn't even have this like connection made before I started talking here, but it is a pretty good way to think about it, I think. And And... And I know that we're, and that's like, that's what the point of this discussion, these discussion episodes are like, we're going to come to these things together and hopefully it means something. If not to you, then it does to me. So, but it will, I think mean something because I mean, I know I've talked about these things with friends a, a whole lot and drilling it, repeating it, drilling it into your head is so important. Um, especially for me, it's going to be continue to be important for me as I finish editing book four and start 
writing book five, I mean, finishing now is the scary, I mean, is, is scary. That's the next thing, right? So, I mean, you, you start out, you're afraid of how you start out, you're afraid of how you follow up, and then you're afraid of how you finish. I mean, I've never, obviously, I mean, never finished a series before, especially at this scale. And that's definitely something that I'm dealing with now. I've had the ideas in my head of where it's going to, of where it was going to end for, for quite a while. So I'm not terribly worried, but when you get the words to the page, it's, it's, when you start putting the words to the page, it, there's definitely going to be that, like, first of all, like, holy crap, this is the last, <laughs> this is the last of this world that I'm going to be working with because I will not write a spinoff. I will not. Do you understand me? There will be no spinoff. I started to do short stories of it and I couldn't because spinoffs are dumb. They're dumb. 100% of the time, dumb. You write a Star Wars spinoff? Dumb. That's how you end up with The Last Jedi. Dumb. The Force Awakens? Dumb. Less dumb, but still dumb. Spinoffs are a waste of time. 100%. Yeah, but, but The Avengers was good. Infinity War was good. Spinoff. Dumb. And don't tell me that it's a sequel. It's not. The Avengers world does not make any sense at all. Why? In the Winter Soldier, the plot of that movie was that S.H.I.E.L.D., which is like the Avengers' whole organization, is under threat. And it's in the modern time, that movie. Why is it that only Captain America is fighting to defend S.H.I.E.L.D.? Spinoff. Dumb. God. I'm looking forward to the Avengers Friday. I have my tickets already. Or at least I'm going to, about to get them today. Can't wait. Honestly, Infinity War was pretty good. But spinoff, dumb. What was I saying? Who knows? Let's end this off. Let's finish this strong. We've been talking about finishing, so let's finish strong. To the bold alone, welcome back. I'm excited to have you here. If you made it this far, I fucking love you. This is an explicit podcast. I'm going to say what I want when I want. I fucking love my gang. The civil gang will be with me till I die. Or at least till I finish this series and then I'll call it something different. Where am I right now? I'm in Austin, Texas. Like I said, I'm finishing editing book four right now. I could not be more excited to bring book four to you. It is going to be so motherfucking good. It's going to make you cry in your sleep at night. Just knowing that there will never be another book four of the Civil Land series. And then there will be book five. So you'll cry again. And then you'll cry again because it'll be done. And you'll have to wait until the next series by your cult gang leader, Nicholas Austin. God, what a beautiful, beautiful way to go out. Subscribe, listen, tell your friends, share, win the giveaway. And to the bold alone, I'll talk to you next week. Happy Tuesday, or whatever day.